So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this, uh, uh, my presentation on read-only root file systems. So I'll start off with a quick introduction, if my thing works. Oh, okay. This is what happens when you don't. Yes. Um, licenses, will you skip that? Uh, me, you, some people know, may know me already. Um, I'm a trainer and consultant in Embedded Linux. I've been doing this for quite some time. And uh, I recently published a book on the subject. Uh, you can contact me there at LinkedIn, Google Plus, and other places. But this is really about then um, read-only root file system. Why would you uh, need it? I hope to persuade you that it's a good idea. And uh, things that go wrong when you try to implement a read-only root file system, and some hints on how to put things right again. Um, this um, talk has turned out to be a bit of a work in progress. I had hoped to present a complete uh, a solution to the problem. Turns out it's more complicated than that. So uh, I'm leaving some, uh, some loose ends at the end here. Uh, the other thing is that in the abstract, I promised a, uh, some demonstrations, some live demos. Um, I've decided to leave those out. Uh, so you will not, uh, I'm, I'm denying you the schadenfreude of seeing me make an ass of myself with a demo that goes wrong. I apologize for that. Um, but I've, uh, what I actually did in the end is I, I, I kind of ran the demo in my office while it was all nice and quiet and everything worked perfectly, and I put the slides, uh, I put the screenshots onto the slide. That's called cheating. Uh, so why, <coughs> excuse me, why read only root file system? Well, those, those are the reasons. Um, we're mostly talking about uh, devices running flash file, uh, on flash file systems. We want to reduce the wear on flash memory. Uh, that increases the le length of, of the, the life cycle of our product. Um, it reduces or possibly eliminates uh, uh, file system corruption if, if the thing's read only. In theory, uh, files can't get corrupted. It avoids accidents. Accidents both at the user interface level, but more uh, importantly, <laughs> accidents at the coding level and the application level. Um, again, if it's read-only, uh, your app can't uh, somehow accidentally, by some unknown mechanism, uh, suddenly delete everything from the root. <coughs> it also uh, makes it easier to do image updates. If we have a read-only uh, root file system, uh, image updates become much easier because we can just drop a new, file, uh, a new root file system image in there and uh, nothing else to worry about. And in the same kind of vein, it makes factory reset easier uh, because we can just delete the, uh, the, the, the partition that contains the state. So for all these reasons, read-only root file systems are a good thing. And it's been my opinion for uh, a good many years that every embedded system should employ a read-only root file system. And I hope all of you guys out there who are producing embedded systems, you are, of course, making your root file system read-only. Nods. So um, it's easy, yes? All you've got to do is mount rootfs with the RO option. Job done. Um, well, of course, no, it isn't. It isn't that easy. Of course, there are some things that uh, we need, to, there's some, some uh, files that change, some stuff that we need to retain information of. Some examples are, are given here, passwords, random seeds, and such like. Uh, all of this stuff we need to, re to preserve somewhere. So we need to start segmenting uh, the, uh, the, the, the memory areas, the storage areas of our system. So I divided it into uh, three chunks. Uh, the first at the top there, we have the root file system, which is going to be read-only. That's the whole point of this. 
but we need uh, somewhere to store the stuff that does change as we go through a session. So there's a second area there uh, which I've marked uh, as uh, user data. And collectively, this is non-volatile non information, so all of this stuff needs to be stored in flash memory. And then we have the third area, uh, temporary files, stuff that uh, we don't need to preserve across reboots. And so we can put that into a, a RAM disk, a tempfs or something. So we have those three basic areas for any embedded system. And the current buzzword is stateless. So in this context then, state is uh, anything that changes, any file that changes. And we can characterize this as being either uh, non-volatile state, i.e. stuff that we need to preserve uh, across reboots, uh, passwords, random seeds, SSH keys, that kind of thing, uh, and stuff that is volatile, stuff that uh, we only need for one session, but we don't need it when we reboot. So to create a stateless root file system, we need to identify the state, things that change, and we need to decide whether it's uh, per session or uh, persistent. Uh, the persistent stuff we put into the non-volatile storage area, the uh, non-persistent stuff, the volatile stuff we put into the volatile area. Good. So if we take this just a little bit further, uh, you will see, uh, particularly in, in the context of containerized systems, Docker and uh, Core OS and these things, uh, the idea of um, having a package system or, or a componentized system uh, where we have a base OS and then we have containers uh, that are loaded into that. The containers themselves are stateless because it turns out that adding state into a container really messes up uh, the, the deployment of these things. And so uh, in that context, they, uh, these guys will define uh, stateless as being not only read-only, uh, but also able to, um, uh, uh, all, all of the components should contain their, their a default configuration so that even if you wipe out the etc directory, it should still know what to do. So this is the nirvana of, uh, of statelessness. Once you achieve uh, that state of enlightenment, enlightenment, then certain things become easier. So factor reset, for example, is trivial now. You simply need to delete the non-volatile state. That puts everything back to uh, the default conditions. You should have a system that basically works and can then be reconfigured for a particular uh, deployment. Likewise, system update uh, becomes much easier. Uh, assuming we're talking about uh, image-based updates here, which I am, then uh, uh, deploying a new root file system image is a uh, simple question of overwriting uh, the current file system image. You don't have to worry about preserving the state because the state is stored somewhere else. And uh, this is something that uh, is actually quite a hot topic. I think I counted uh, four talks this week on the subject of system update. Uh, one of which is mine. So I uh, hope to see you all again uh, tomorrow at uh, 1400. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, how do we achieve it? First of all then, uh, I want to look at how do you identify the state? How do you identify the files that are changing? And I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of simple tools uh, that every system, pretty much every system has, uh, disk stats and block dump. Disk stats then, uh, this is just a file in the proc file system. It gives you a breakdown of disk IO activity per, uh, per uh, storage device and per partition on that device. Here's a, a dump of disk stats. Let's come over to the side for a minute. 
So in this case, uh, we can see that we have uh, on the device, which is a MMC uh, device, we have 2,640 reads, uh, that's field one. And then if we jump along to uh, field five, 127 writes. And then we can see that the writes are mostly on, uh, uh, block, uh, on partition two, 118 uh, there, and a few on uh, partition nine. Sorry, partition five. So that tells us um, where the problems are, where the state has been modified, and we can identify whether we need to investigate this. In this particular device, the root file system was partition two, so that's where we'd want to uh, investigate further. Incidentally, this uh, format is not particularly easy to read from uh, just by catting proc. If you want something formatted slightly better and you have VMstat installed, uh, VMstat does this, this, the, uh, the, uh, this printout, and, but it formats it slightly nicer. But it doesn't tell you who made those changes. So the next useful tool is uh, block dump. <coughs> so block dump is a trigger you can set to uh, enable logging of access at the, at the block IO level. We just need to write uh, one to proxys VM block dump. And then from that point on onwards, it will log all reads and writes. So, simple example, uh, I then write uh, a string to a file, and then I look at the D message, and we see that here we dirtied uh, an inode associated with the file world.txt, and we do that twice. I'm guessing that's one of those is when it was created, and the other is when it's closed and the access time is updated. And because I'm doing this within an ash shell, we also get a couple of changes to the ash history file. And then sometime later, the, uh, uh, the journaling block daemon comes along and it actually writes those changes uh, from the page cache to uh, particular, I, uh, particular uh, blocks on the storage mechanism. So looking at this then, uh, the interesting stuff is, first of all, we want to look for the word dirted because that gives us the file name. And it also tells us which volume uh, the write was on. So VDA, uh, this actually did this uh, on uh, running on QEMU. So this is using the Vertio uh, uh, block device. So to uh, get a complete uh, history of writes to our, um, uh, to our file system, uh, you simply need to add a, uh, an early boot script uh, that writes one to um, proxys uh, VM block dump, and then boot up, and then just filter out the junk so uh, I'm grepping for dirted and uh, on VDA, and we see something like this. So this is booting a, a clean, uh, newly installed, um, uh, that's actually a, a, a Yocto, or rather a Pocky um, core image minimal. And we see all, trust, all sorts of things are happening. Password file is updated, random seed is updated, uh, the uh, SSH keys for drop bear uh, are written. Uh, UDEV cache does something. Uh, MOTD gets updated, and actually a whole bunch of other things as well. So this gives us a detailed list of things uh, that are changing. One slight annoyance when looking at this is that we only get the, um, the, the base name. We don't get the full uh, path name, but that's not a huge problem. Uh, it also gives us the inode name, so if we really want to, we can use find uh, minus inum or something and get the full path name. If, if we're not exactly sure where, mm, I don't know, um, random seed is stored, 
then we, do, we could do a find on that inode and find out exactly which file it's been stored in. Um, so, we have a list of things we need to look at. So the kind of problems we're, we're having then are, first of all, on first boot, <coughs> at least on a, a Yocto project uh, system, quite a lot of bits and pieces of the uh, root file system get updated. Um, so we saw uh, the uh, drop bear writes uh, its SSH keys to EGC drop bear. Uh, we see that UDEV uh, writes its uh, snapshot to UDEV cache and a whole bunch of other things as well. So we would need to resolve those problems. Uh, either by, make, uh, by uh, making those changes uh, at build time, so there's no uh, particular reason why udev cache tar gz has to be generated on first boot. We could pre-create that file uh, as part of the build process and then just up it in there. Or just do without it altogether. Udev still works without it, but it does take a little bit longer to boot up. Um, the other solution uh, would be to uh, take these uh, files that need to be changed and uh, create kind of golden copies of these somewhere and then uh, boot up, copy them into a suitable uh, storage area and use sim links or whatever so that they then get picked up. So first time boot is a problem. Um, and then we get uh, stuff that is legitimately and has to change at runtime, network config, random seed, log files, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to look at uh, some of those in the next few slides and suggest some obvious uh, solutions. Essentially, it comes down to... Uh, well, I'm taking a pragmatic, pragmatic approach. So essentially, I'm taking a standard uh, Yocto build, and then I'm kind of fiddling around with it uh, to fix up the problems I find. So typically, the way to do this is to take any files within the root file system that are written to and replace them with sim links, symbolic links, to a, uh, a user data partition somewhere, which is going to store the, uh, the non-volatile state. Or we can choose to sim link or uh, in other way, otherwise provide a, a, a RAM disk, a tempfs. You can do something slightly different using an overlay file system such as UnionFS. So UnionFS kind of does the same thing, but in a slightly different way. You have your read under root file system, and then you overlay that with a UnionFS so that any changes you make to the read-only root file system actually are made in the union FS, uh, which is a, a separate area of storage. Uh, so first pass. Um, this is kind of the canned demo that I was going to do and I'm not doing. <coughs> um, we need to uh, make the uh, root file system read-only, so we add a RO there, which is fine and fair enough. And I have added in a new partition, uh, VDB in this case, and I'm mounting it in slash data. So slash data is my non-volatile uh, data storage. And then we use tempfs for various bits and pieces uh, that are the volatile state. So specifically the run directory, there should be nothing in run that needs to be preserved over a reboot. Likewise, var volatile. And you'll find somewhere else that uh, slash TMP is a symbolic link to var volatile. So that takes care of our volatile state as well. Um, so, problem areas log files. Uh, every damn thing wants to write its own logs. Some stuff right through syslog. Um, 
If everything were to write through syslog daemon, then in some ways that would be easier because we, we could just use the busybox uh, syslog daemon, which has a log to RAM option, a minus C option. Um, but in general, things don't play uh, quite so nicely. Everyone wants to write their own log files. Do we really care about these log files? Depends. Many times, we don't really care about preserving log files uh, for posterity. So uh, the, the simplest solution is just to make the log files uh, volatile so that we have the log for one session, but if we reboot, we lose that log. Or you can simlink the, those log files, uh, that, that log directory rather, into your volatile storage, and you can keep the complete history, or at least some portion of the history of your, of your device. It depends. Um, in my example here, if we're using Pocky uh, Core Image Minimal, which is what I'm basing on this on, then uh, by default, that actually puts the uh, var log here as a symbolic link into volatile log. So if you're using Pocky default parameters, you do end up with volatile log files. Uh, random seed, uh, no big deal. We need to preserve, um, in, in order, if you're using uh, the pseudo random number generator dev, you random, which almost certainly you will be, then it's very important to preserve the random seed uh, between boots. Otherwise, you start from the same point in the pseudo random um, uh, sequence and you have a, a less secure random, random generator. <clears throat> Um, so we can either add in a symbolic link so that uh, varlib u random uh, points to our non-volatile, uh, sorry, our, yes, our non-volatile uh, temporary storage, or we can actually just go and hack it. It's actually just a, a simple shell script which does, does a DD at start and end. So that's, that's easy to fix. Um, likewise, well, okay, so we can, with, uh, with Dropbear, we can do this in two ways. We only actually need to generate the SSH keys once. Uh, so we could uh, do this as part of the build system. But it would have to be done, of course, per device. There's no point having the same SSH keys for every device. That kind of defeats the object. So again, the simplest thing to do in this case is to generate the uh, SSH keys at boot time uh, but by symlinking or other mechanisms, store them in the non-volatile area. Doing less on first boot. Um, hmm. This is uh, kind of stating the obvious, maybe. Uh, the, the reason I haven't gone into more detail here is that in order to solve these problems, you actually need to delve into the packages and the boot system and uh, fix up a bunch of things. So I'm kind of skipping this. Okay. Um, Looking at some concrete examples of systems that are deployed out there, uh, Android and Brillo are a good uh, example of how to do this properly. One of, the, one of the nice things about Android is that right from the very start, it had a stateless uh, root file system, except they didn't call it root, they called it system, but same concept. And all of the state in an Android device is stored in the user data partition which is uh, mounted on slash data. And as a result of that, Android devices are d able to do factory resets very easily. You just wipe slash data. And they have the o up OTA update mechanism, which allows you to update the uh, system image and therefore update to a new version of Android. Uh, Yocto is uh, kind of edging its way into this area somewhat. So right now, and for some time, there has been uh, an image feature, read-only read rootfs, um, which does what it says. It mounts the root file system read-only. 
the main uh, problem is it doesn't have anywhere to store the, uh, the, the non-volatile state. So if you uh, actually do this, you will find that, for example, uh, the drop bear SSH keys are stored in a, in a RAM disk, which means that every time you reboot, you get a new set of SSH keys, which means that when you try to log on to it, you have to reestablish those credentials. Um, also, it doesn't bother to keep the random seed, so uh, it means that you have a less secure random number generator, and so on and so on and so on. Now, the reason that the Yocto guys haven't done this is because it's difficult. It means you need to go into every single package and make it um, state less aware. So, I actually got through this slightly quicker than I was intending to, probably because I didn't do the demo. Um, so, conclusion then. Yes, read-only root file systems are a very good idea, as I think we all agree. Uh, we have uh, tools, uh, distat and block dump, uh, which allow us to identify problem areas and to identify individual culprits, so we know who is changing what. And we have uh, some ideas about how to change, how to resolve problems by symbolic linking uh, uh, files to the non-volatile storage using UnionFS uh, and using tempfs for volatile data. And that's almost literally it. So since I've gone through that fairly quickly, we have time for a Q&A. Uh, the slides themselves, by the way, they are—they should be on the um, uh, on, on the conference web page, but I'm not convinced. I haven't actually checked if they're there or not. They're not present. Okay. Well, they are definitely present on SlideShare because I uploaded them last night. Uh, but they will, uh, in the fullness of time, appear on the conference website as well. Uh, so, any questions? Okay, well, you were the first, so. Uh, so you mentioned the team link option, but in that does it mean that the, the team link is unscriptable? Because if you remove the data directory, you would have team link something which is not linked. Uh, correct. So if you, as, as I describe, just simply adding sim links to every file that gets changed, uh, and then you uh, erase the, the data directory, you will end up with dangling sim links. Uh, so I didn't literally uh, mean that you would wipe the entire partition, but that you would wipe the content. So you, you need to have a, 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 a file, uh, sorry, a directory structure in that uh, non-volatile, the, the slash data directory, uh, and you need to erase the, con uh, the individual parts of that. Yeah, so you, you're absolutely right. So I, I'm, I'm kind of skating over a couple of things here. Um, so in the pragmatic case, you would need to preload the data directory with uh, default configurations for the uh, ETC PWD, for example, ETC group, and so on. You would need to preload uh, known versions of those. Um, in the ideal case, if we were to, instead of doing that just by pre-populating the, uh, the non-volatile uh, storage, if we were to actually build into every single package uh, sensible defaults, then we wouldn't need to do that. Yeah. So and the, that, that's the case with Android, for example. With Android, you can literally erase uh, slash data, and uh, the Android, when it reboots, will regenerate uh, the things. It will repopulate the Dalvik cache and all the other things it needs to do. Yeah. We're not really quite there yet with, say, Yocto. Do we, do, we have a, do we have a microphone anywhere? Okay, right. Uh, yeah, it'd be useful if, if you could uh, ask questions via the microphone there, because then the, uh, that would be pick, picked up and it would be recorded um, and, uh, for posterity. <coughs> so, yeah, 
Next question. Uh, would you mind? You maybe have to turn it on. Um, okay, now it's on. Um, would you um, mind uh, losing some words on the advantages and disadvantages um, between symlinking and using an overlay file system? Um, so the differences between symlinking, overlay, UnionFS, and such like. Um, it, it's kind of a personal thing, maybe. I prefer the idea of symlinking because I feel it gives me more control. I can see exactly where the symlinks are. And if you happen to modify a file which doesn't have a symlink, then you'll get an error. Whereas if you simply plonk uh, a UnionFS on top of your root file system, then any write to the root file system will be allowed. And so you don't have so much control over what ends up in the non-volatile state. Plus you get dependency. Plus you get dependency. Well, well I don't know. Ex explain that a little bit. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the, the one, divan one disadvantage of UnionFS Union is you have to build UnionFS into your system, yes. yes. It's certainly true, yeah. Over there at the back? Again, it'd be useful if you could use the microphone. Uh, just a, a question about the symlinks. Uh, group I've worked with have looked at uh, doing this, and they quickly found that there's certain things that use ono follow on their opens of files in Etsy. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you have to start worrying about patching stuff to take that out. Because if you go to symlink it into your non-volatile partition, the opens start to fail because it won't follow the symlink. Yeah, some, so some clever people have identified symlinks as being a potential uh, attack vector and have coded uh, things not to do. Uh, do you have any, any exa actual examples of that? Uh, I thought Etsy Group was one of them, actually, but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. It started um, to be, we were discussing about how much we'd have to BB append in, in uh, our layer to try and patch out this stuff. So. Um, I, I mean, the, there was no simple answer to that. You. you we're changing the behavior, which we're changing the definition of, of certain files. We're moving them from one place to another. So there may be cases where we have to add some patches. Yes, okay. I agree. They um, actually decided to use OverlayFS instead <laughs> because of that. But so, you, so using UnionFS would kind of avoid that problem because things are apparently in the same place. The, 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 the path names don't change. Yeah. Um, I, I feel that the real solution to this is to, is to actually push this out into the packages and make the packages uh, stateless aware. But we're not there yet. Thank you. Uh, over there. <laughs> My question is um, still about symlinks. Um, hmm. Okay. We, we thought about doing symlinks, but we found out that, as he said, they're prone to attacks and all that. And we implemented this with buy mounts. Do you have any sort of view on using, you know, buy mounting from a non volatile state to the volatile state with just simple buy mounts in FS tab or system D mount services? Uh, yes, yeah, so we could use, uh, so we can use uh, the bind mount, which allows us essentially to. Uh, mount a, a, a one directory to kind of move it into a, a different uh, file system. Um, yep, that would certainly work. Um, it would, I mean, it only works at the directory level, so you'd have to uh, it, buy it mount works on the, It works on the file level as well. Yeah, you, you can buy mount files, no you can problem. Buy the files. It works, okay, I apologize, it works on the file level. Um, yeah, that, that works. I, I've not actually used that technique. Um, I have a feeling that it's uh, li uh, higher overhead, but I, I, that's just a, I don't know if I mean, yeah, it is a bit more overhead than symlinks, obviously, but um, it, is, it is traceable. It's not, uh, you know everything where it goes, so 
Hmm. It's easier to reconstruct the state because you know, uh, you have defined what you want you to know buy, what's where what, you yeah. want to buy. And so you can redefine, you can repopulate your non-volatile state quite mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. No, okay, that's a, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, person over there? Um, question about System D. Um, I've seen System D has some support for doing this kind of um, stateless. Like how it does. much of it is there, and how much of it works? Uh, is it complete when you get to the end of it, or is it going to leave me halfway with a half um, with a half solution? Uh, System D has uh, a nice set of tools which allow you to do some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, in a, a, a simple way. The, the problem is that you, I mean, it, it's not for free. You have to do some changes to the packages to use systemd in the right way instead of the scripts and so on. So it's not a solution itself, but it is a tool which gets you closer to that solution. So for example, it has some uh, quite neat little, you know, what, what one particular area which I haven't actually uh, covered in the slides is the question of user IDs, which are stored in etc password. So as you install packages, quite often they have to add user IDs uh, for, that, for, the, for that particular package, for the daemons that are going to be running within that package. So therefore, etc password uh, becomes uh, a file that needs to be updated when you install packages, which is a pain. So systemd has uh, a nice set of mechanisms, actually, which allow uh, the etc password uh, to be made to, to be a, a volatile file and uh, there are some units you can add into uh, systemd to create usernames, user IDs, uh, kind of on the fly. So that kind of thing is in systemd. It is improving uh, as the releases go along. Um, so that's certainly part of the solution, but it's not the complete solution. I, when I wrote the slides, I kind of tried to not make it systemd specific because uh, an awful lot of embedded systems are still using other init uh, programs. Systemd is by no means ubiquitous for us embedded guys. Okay. I don't know where the mouse is. Uh, it's on its way. Since we're mentioning Yocto and Pocky, um, there is actually a mechanism to go along with the uh, read-only root file system. Uh, I don't remember the name of it right now, a volatile pass or something like that. Uh, it's a recipe where you can actually add uh, mount points that you want to be bind mounted if the root FS is read-only. Mm -hmm. By default, uh, it will do that for var lib but it can easily be uh, extended to do it for anything. For example, we've used it to bind mount etc if the root FS is uh, read-only. Okay, and so uh, is, uh, is that a, a, a class or a BB class? Or? Uh, it's a recipe, so you can just BB append to it, uh, whatever uh, oh, okay, right, gotcha. bind mounts you, you want and where, to, where they should be mounted. Cool, and um, the name of that recipe is? I think it's volatile pass or something like that. Volatile pass. It's, it's definitely volatile something. <laughs> volatile binds, yeah, right. Volatile binds. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, anyone else? If not, we'll call it lunchtime. Okay, well, thank you all very much, and uh, hope to see you around.